everybody has wisdom and valuable and unique experiences. And it's about when I coach, it's, I've realized that it's not only like me teaching, it's actually, we can all learn from each other. If you asking for, for help, for money, for support, like whatever it is, you get, you gotta be, you gotta learn that skill. Cause it'll just progress will be very fast. You know, they say people don't like change. It's not that people don't like change, it's people don't like being changed. Sometimes you meet one person and that person changes your life. Cause you go, and then, so you gotta be open to that. But I, I just think you have to have this, you have to have a basis of, if you know, you know, not a lot of people know when you ask on the street, hey, you know, what do you wanna do in life and all that? You know, people are, oh. listen to what they say. Don't just look at the social media because you know, they're honest about it. They're honest that it, it was hard work and that it took them years or, or, or decades to get to where they are. So when you change a habit, what you have to understand is that just knowing something in your conscious mind in the top half of that circle doesn't translate into new results because you haven't internalized that knowledge yet. Welcome to this new episode. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor for the podcast, Moxie Monitor. If you've been following my work, you know that the Moxie is a tool that I use a lot for testing, but also for everyday training and coaching. For those who don't know about the Moxie Monitor yet, it's a NIRS device that measures muscle oxygen saturation and blood volume in real time. It's a non-invasive sensor that is placed on the skin and can be worn during any training or sporting activity. Motocross riders and climbers wear it on their forearms, hockey players on the ice, swimmers can wear it in water. I've used it to test rugby players, CrossFit athletes, endurance athletes, and more. The Moxie allows you to individualize work and rest periods, optimize load, reps and sets, identify training thresholds in real time, and even correct movement based on what the data shows you. You can also use the Moxie monitor to determine an athlete's energetic limiting factor and their individual training zones. Using this process, I can now target the athlete's limiter with precision in order to improve their performance without adding unnecessary volume to their program. You can view and collect the data on your Garmin watch and can also pair the Moxie with other physiological testing products such as the VO2 Master, Pinoe, and Cosmet VO2 systems. The Moxie is a product I've been using for many months with great success, and I highly recommend it to any coach who's interested in digging a little bit deeper on the physiological side of health, fitness, or performance. You can use the coupon UPSIDE at checkout for a 5% discount on moxiemonitor.com slash shop. That's UPSIDE, U-P-S-I-D-E for a 5% discount. With that said, let's get into the show. Okay, David, we're live on the podcast. How you doing? Good. Thanks for being, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's my pleasure as well. We were supposed to record that a week ago, but you got caught in traffic in the spot that I then visited just a, a few, you know, a few days later, you were down in Ticino. Yeah. I mean, we did the, the bungee jump that James Bond in, I think it was GoldenEye, right? GoldenEye, he, yeah. I watched that one many times at my grandparents' uh, caravan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, when you were, did you think about doing the jump when you were there? Um, it, it wasn't in the plans with the kids and the family, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I say that, but I say that cause I'm on the podcast, but I think that I would, I would do it, you know, knowing the, the safety around those kind of things nowadays, it's, it, I'd, I'd probably be less scared to jump, to bungee jump in a, in a setting like this than maybe, you know, there's that little bridge that's just a little bit higher up from that dam. And it's, it's not it's high. It's 14 meters off the water and you're, you're jumping into very, very cold water. Um, I feel like there's probably more things that can go wrong doing this than there are bungee jumping. I might be wrong, but I don't know how, how did, so you did it. How did you feel? How was it? Yeah. Look, my, my girlfriend, she, she gave it to me for uh, Christmas, right? And she's done it before. And she asked me before the jump, David, what's, what's courage? <laughs> what, what's courage to you? Okay, is that a question to me? Well, I'm, I'm asking you, then I'll, I'll give you, I, I didn't have a good answer, but she had a good answer. But what, what, what's courage for you? How would you define it? Courage, I, 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 what comes to mind when you say this is uh, everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. So I think it's, it's got to be going through with something that you're afraid of, knowing that, knowing that you're going to get to the other side and that whatever's there is probably a little bit better than what you 
are here or at least closer to where you want to get to. Does that make sense? Yeah, for me, for me, total sense. But when she asked me, I was kind of like mumbling and I didn't really have a good answer. She's, she's like, David, courage is not having no fear. Courage is having fear, having the emotions, but still doing it. Doing it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And oh boy, that was true. You know, like when I was, when I got on the plateau, like at first you have like, you see down and you can still hold on to things. And obviously they like put you in, you know, they, they attach you to everything. So you're safe mm. and it's like, cool. But then you have to take another half meter off the plateau. And it's just, I mean, there's like, it goes down and I, I wanted to play it cool. And, you know, she was taking video and I knew I could, you know, but I couldn't control my legs. You know, they were starting, my knees were starting to go like, <laughs> like this uncontrollably. And I just tried to like hang out there for like, you know, a bit longer than what was, com well, it was uncomfortable anyhow, but I wanted to soak it in and be in that uncomfortable position. You did, you know, spread your arms and then three, two, one, and then you jump. And yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's so amazing. And how, yeah, how high is it? It's like 230 meters. Wow. That's, but you know, I knew <laughs> my girlfriend was jumping before me mm -hmm. and I knew I, I wasn't scared at all that she wasn't going to come back up. I was just excited to see her face and, you know, see her jump. So I, in that moment, I knew I'm not really scared for my life. Mm -hmm. It's just fear of height, fear of the unknown or whatever. So I could rationalize it away and I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. Right. But uh, definitely an experience. I would recommend it to every anybody and I, I show it to my private clients now you know the jump because i think it shows a lot of mm -hmm. things that sometimes we want to stay in control of the body but it doesn't work because the body's doing his own thing right and it's a good yeah it's is a it, good is, way to experience it would you say it's the scariest thing you've ever done oh, man, i think maybe the first time skydiving was even scarier because i wasn't used to, you know i didn't know what to expect and all of a sudden yeah that door opens and you're like shit you know this is a, never been in an airplane with a door open and it's yeah i think that was the scariest and this one was i could enjoy it i was very uncomfortable i was scared but i could still you know enjoy it so how how long does the drop last and how long does it feel well, it felt like no time, but I think it's like maybe three seconds or so. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you're down there really fast, but it's like this initial, all right, you jump and then oh yeah, you kind of, I blanked. <laughs> you just like accelerate and you get that feeling in your, you know, your stomach is kind of turning and you're going head first. I mean, but it was wonderful. I highly recommend. Uh, did you do some, you know, reflection on that jump after you, after you did it? Did you think a little bit more about like you said, the emotions that, that you went through and what it, what it meant and, and all of those. Did you have a little bit of time since then to, to think about it? Yeah, I, I can put myself in a high energy state just really using visualization because, it was, I mean, it's burning in there. Arms out, there's mm -hmm. nothing, you know, nothing to hold on and you're just standing there. There's a little bit of wind coming, so, you know, and visualizing that gives me a lot of energy. I can make my heart rate go up, right? I can really kind of relive it again and again. And so, yeah, with the fear, you know, I think, yeah, I show it to all my clients. I show them the jump and it just shows how, you know, your mind wants one thing, but it doesn't always, you know, your body is not always just doing that, right? Because, you know, and it's sometimes we cannot explain what's happening. That's mm -hmm. why it's good to look at it and start to understand. And, and um, so I think uh, it was a good experience. Oh, I mean, for me as well, it's just... Oh, I'll do it in a heartbeat again if I could jump. And then, you know, we went to the other bridge that's 14 meters. Yes. And I, I went down there and it looked like peanuts after. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that, that makes sense. David, for those who don't know who you are, can you talk a little bit about your background and what you do? Yeah. So I, w I was a swimmer when I was younger and my highlight was the 2012 Olympics in London. Um, I was very unaware of what was going on in my life up until three years ago. And that was long after swimming, right? And um, three years ago, a lot has changed because the, somebody started to, there was a man who started to wake me up to the powers that we human beings have in with our mind, the power to create, create what we love. And he told me that, you know, David, look around and think about everything that's not grown by mother nature everything that's not green basically is like we human beings we created it right so like 
this pen here, it just existed as somebody's idea as a thought. And then with time, we moved it into physical form. The webcam that we're using, the phone, like literally like the water bottle, everything was just an idea first and we moved it in physical form. And, and, and then, you know, Michael Jordan, he had a dream to be the best basketball player and he moved it into form. And when he told me, you can create the life that you love, you can create, you can create, you're a creative machine. I was like, wow, this is a cool concept. I've never heard of that. And mm -hmm. I was so intrigued that I started to, you know, get a lot of coaching, read a lot of books. And it fascinated me so much that, you know, the last three years I've been not doing nothing but that. And I, you know, you're finding more and more and realizing that there's a lot of knowledge out like important knowledge that they're not teaching in school, mm -hmm. like how to be confident, how to deal with relationships, how to make money. They don't teach you that stuff in school, but it would be like good skills to have. Right. They, they're kind of the important ones. <laughs> right. I mean, I, yeah. So, and, and that's just, and, and, and I was the biggest question that I always had was like, why did nobody introduce me to this earlier? But what I also learned is that I got to take self responsibility for everything that I do good mm -hmm. and bad. And so it was probably not probably for sure. It was always around. I mm -hmm. just didn't hear it, didn't see it, didn't pick up on it. And then when the time was right, I was a happy man, you know, that since then my life really, it has changed so much. It's taken off in terms of relationships, in terms of money, the expression that I'm just being myself that, yeah, I understand myself much better. And uh, yeah, that's incredibly rewarding. And then I transitioned out of banking because I was in banking um, into coaching first executives because that was kind of the lowest hanging fruit because I had a lot of contacts mm -hmm. from banking. But then um, when COVID came, I was like, started to listen to my heart and, you know, once an athlete, it, but that fire never really goes away. I still train a lot and not swimming, but fighting. So I'm like involved in it. I love it. I love movement. I know you do. Mm. It's healthy. It's good for us. And, and then I just transitioned over into coaching athletes. As, um, like, like you said, once an athlete, always an athlete. And I think there, there, there has to be something really valuable to, have experienced those different settings. You said you were, you know, in the Olympics. And even though you mentioned that you, you felt like you weren't really quote unquote awake until, you know, much, much later, you still have that, that past and that, that experience that you can now use to, I think it, it just adds so much context to what we do, right? We're able to put it in the right context for the people that we're working with. You said, you know, you work with executives, you were in banking, you work with athletes, you've been an athlete. And that, that has a lot of value when it, when it comes to coaching and teaching because you can frame things properly. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, would, I would hope so. I mean, our story, I, I hope you agree with me, right? But the story where we come from, and that's really, that's one of the things that I've learned nowadays when we meet on Zoom, because most of it is online at the moment, is like everybody has wisdom and valuable and unique experiences. And it's about when I coach, it's, I've realized that it's not only like me teaching, it's actually we can all learn from each other because, you know, that wisdom in a lot of people, it's locked up inside of them. But all of a sudden, when, when you can create that safe environment, when athletes start to share what they have experienced, all of a sudden, if I give you an example, we have um, Nicolas Spirik, who is the Swiss um, Olympic champion in triathlon. Mm -hmm. She's going to compete in her fifth Olympics um, in, a, in a couple of days. Three-time mom, incredible superwoman. And when, when she's sharing about, you know, the self-doubt that is coming up before races and how she, her mind is racing and all that, it's, you sit there and imagine you're like a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old and you're looking up to like this Olympic champ. Even me, I was like, wow, this is so cool that you're sharing this because that you know, makes me and everybody else feel very normal. And you see like everybody has these, I don't want to call it problems because it's, it's normal, but everybody goes through these emotions and, and it's about learning to handle them. It's not, there, there's the courage again, right? It's not about suppressing them or not having them, but it's about learning to deal with it and do it anyways and do what you love anyways. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's pretty cool to do it in the, in a setting, you know, where people, yeah, learn from each other. Yeah, it, it, it has to be one of the most interesting things that personally I've learned from my podcast is that everybody that I can talk to can bring me something if I'm ready to hear 
if I'm ready to listen. Uh, it's not always the case. I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm always in that, in that state, but I, but I try because I, I think it is interesting. What came to mind when you mentioned that is I think something that Jordan Peterson said, for those who've, uh, who know the guy or maybe read his book or books now, um, is that when you start asking questions to someone, no matter who it is, you know, it could be quote unquote, a, a, a nobody, but again, everybody's somebody in their own, you know, story in life. But if you start asking questions and listening, people have fascinating things to say. And, and if you're, but again, it, it requires you to put yourself aside and your thoughts aside and let the other person, you know, kind of shine through. And, and like, you, like you said, hearing those stories from different people at, at different levels, and especially, like you said, at the highest level and understanding that it's totally normal to, to think those things and that we just need to learn to live with them rather than just just fight them or try to suppress them. Or uh, I guess it's probably hard because we, we do get so many signals of perfection mm -hmm. and the need to be right and perfect that we all think that this is normal, but that, you know, being, being flawed and making mistakes is just as important as, as the rest of it. Yeah. And it's a kind of a paradox. And I mean, you know, I'm work, I'm talking from my own experience, right? We hear these things all the time in the, the most, the wise, wisest people on the planet tell us, right, that we all make mistakes and you hear it and you know it, but still, still, we're like, but, you know, and <laughs> yeah, there's quite a lot of paradoxes like this out there. There's also another one, for example, that I see very often is that, you know, when we're speaking about levels of awareness in a certain topic, if you have somebody who has this level of awareness and somebody who has this level of awareness, for that person, it's very easy to see what's going on here because they've been there. They've done it. And it's really easy for them to believe in them because they've done it. They've seen other people do it. But for the people here, it's like a mystery. It's like, they, how, how, do, you know, how does he or she do that? Like, wow, it's like almost like magic. I could never do that, right? But the paradox is if you just learn to ask, if you have this level, and again, it doesn't make you a better or a worse person, but it's just if you learn how to ask, you'll find that oftentimes these people here, you know, they're happy to help. They're happy to, mm. because I believe it's in human nature. If you're not a psychopath, you'll know what I'm talking about. We love helping people. It feels good. And, and so that's another one that I'm, I'm, that I'm big about that. Like with my private clients, I, you know, I, I teach them to ask. It's if you asking for, for help, for money, for support, like well, whatever it is, you, you got to be, you got to learn that skill because they'll just progress really very fast. Is, is there a right way to ask and a wrong way to ask? Who, I mean, in the end of the day, well, I, I don't, I don't think there's, there's one way, right? So there's, I, you gotta learn to, you know, listen to your intuition and go from there and do it your way. Kind of like if you have a tennis player, like there's, there's a lot of stories, right? That where tennis players used to imitate somebody else for a while. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of the coaches of one of the coaches came and they said, well, why don't you just play your game? You have, you know, longer arms and just do your thing. And then all of a sudden, bam, and their performance took off because they started to do their thing. So I think it's good to get inspiration, good best practices, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but then in the end of the day, you got to do what works, what, what you feel comfortable with. And so I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, but you got to be like confident and just go and assume that people want to help you and don't be like, because the worst thing is if you don't ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if you don't ask, you'll, ne you'll never know. And it's interesting what you said, the, the, the playing your own game and being your own person. It, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept to me because like you said, that I, I hear myself in it in the sense that you always try to think of, Oh, I want to be like this guy. Oh, and I want to be with that, like that guy or gal. And then when you don't, you, you, you get disappointed or you think you need to change something. I mean, for me, Joe Rogan is my spirit animal. I like to say, because in the, at least in the world of podcasting, you know, he's, yeah. he's the godfather. He's, he's done it. He's, he's got what 1700 episodes or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, and besides all the other great things that he's done, he's making a living off of it. Um, but again, when I find myself in a, in, in a bind about something, I'm like, I, I always end up with that is like, well, I'm not him. 
right? I'm, I'm me. And, and so I don't have to do exactly the same thing and, 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 and go the same way. I have to find my own way. And, and that might be, you know, having, having coaches on and then sometimes, sometimes having athletes. I debated for a while, should I speak in English or in French in my podcast? At the end of the day, I said, fuck it. I'll do both because I can and I want to and I don't care. And if people want to listen to one or the other or both, then good for them. But at the end of the day, you, you have to follow your own path and, 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 and be your old self. Is that something that came to you before that moment in, in 2019 or, or, or afterwards, being your own self and following your own path? I came with kind of with the waking up because I, I got to tell you, like before that, like my life was, it was good. And I, I'll tell you what happened. I kind of, I had quite a lot of success in swimming. Now I never made it to the top, top level, but I made it to the Olympics. Right. And one of the things what happened to me is that as a kid, I did have a dream to win Olympic gold. I didn't have that dream, but they, people didn't laugh in my face, but they, they kind of told me, well, you know, there's other things. There is school and you, you got, and we'll see later. And that dream faded. And I started to say, you know, they told me don't daydream and, you know, be realistic, be an adult, all that stuff. And I started to think along the lines, what's realistic for me. So I didn't have the big dream again. And it really was like this. I won Swiss junior champs and I said, well, now I want to win Swiss champs open. And I did that. Then I said, I want to go to the Euro champs, just go, right? And I did that. And then I was like, okay, I want to go to the world champs. And I did that. And then my coach actually came from America at the time. He's like, well, why don't we try for the Olympics? You're really, you know, you're close. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then I did that. And so it kind of manifested, but I never allowed myself to ever dream like really big again, right? And when you compare that with Michael Phelps, I mean, that guy was surrounded by Olympic gold medalist coaches and teammates. It's like gold, gold, gold. And I know, I know because I was in America training there and there's only, they're only thinking about first. Mm. It's crazy. But like, um, what was the question? Why did, why did I go there? <laughs> Be, being yourself. How did you? Yeah, being yourself. Yeah. So completely unaware. And I had quite some success in swimming, but then I transitioned into bank. And all of a sudden, I couldn't recreate that success. And I became kind of unfulfilled, going out a lot, drinking a lot, you know, kind of distracting myself. And when I met that guy, when he started to tell me about the powers and about doing what you love doing and all that, that's when that idea is like, wait, what if that's really possible? What if I really can be myself? And, you know, it, there's a lot of layers to this because, for example, I have a limiting belief that one of them, you know, there's, I'm not worthy. I don't belong. And I have that. I'm not good enough. And when you're creating coming from, I'm not good enough, you're, you're, it's like chasing, you know, the, you have the carrot here and you're chasing the carrot because you're, it's never going to, you're never going to be good enough, right? That's just going to continue and continue. But when you're aware of that, you're creating out of this, then you can say, okay, well, this is what I have been doing, but now let me create what my heart wants, not what my mind is thinking I have to do and all that, but really what my heart wants. And yeah, that idea then was kind of planted in me that I can do what I love and really want to do. And, uh, but yeah, it was only three years ago. And mm -hmm. it's, I th I'm very thankful and grateful that it happened. What, so what's the, what's the process when you talk about, you know, creating, uh, creating the life that you want, essentially, uh, taking responsibility for yourself. How does that all start? Is there, is there an assessment at the beginning? Is there a self-reflective uh, part to it? So when you work with, with athletes or, or with your clients, uh, can you take us through the, the process that, that all this involves in order to, like you said, get to being yourself and in turn achieving the things that you, you set out to achieve? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the, the people that come and do the mental work, right? They, they're already asking good questions. And I, I really believe like the first step is for you. You got to ask the question basically for yourself, because if somebody else, you, you know, they say people don't like change. It's not that people don't like change. It's people don't like being changed. So when I tell somebody what to do, it doesn't work. But if the person is asking the question, then that's when the fire, that's when, you know, and, and you have what you can imagine is like your subconscious mind, your mind is so powerful. And when you ask a question, all of a sudden you'll get your clues here 
and there and you know in unrelated things you're like or you're looking in the cloud and it's like mm, that's what i gotta do you know and i think so the first thing is so that they're asking good questions and i can help with that a little bit and then the next thing that we do is that we define what the dream is right because what i've learned is that we human beings we have a goal seeking mechanism inside of us that when we know what we want it will automatically help us to get there. I'll give you an example, a very simple one, but I love the new Tesla, the, the, the Tesla, the Model S, okay? And a couple of months ago, I made the decision I'm gonna buy one. And now on the street, I swear to God, I see all the Teslas. I see so many <laughs> of them, right? And it's totally automatic. It's just mm -hmm. because I'm focused on that. Another thing that I do, for example, I, you know, I do visualizations for 15 minutes a day. And one of them is to I choose the end result of being a service to kids. Now, when I tune into that only for a minute or so, it's like I imagine myself how, you know, how I'm dealing with kids, the energy that I'm bringing, what I can teach them, you know, just the way I am. And then I guess what happens when I go through the day and I see a kid, it doesn't matter in which situation it is. I'm going to snap right into that. And it's automatic. Right. So we want to know what, what the dream is. And the way we do it um, is that we do a meditation. First, we go into gratitude because gratitude puts your body. First of all, it's very simple to do. You just think of a few things could be huge things, could be people, could be activities, whatever it is that you're grateful for in that moment. And it's very easy to do. Everybody can do it. And that puts you in a very high vibration. And you cannot be, for example, you cannot be grateful and fearful at the same time. It's like a dog can't be happy and sad at the same time, right? And so when you're in a state of gratefulness, we then, you know, I take them through a guided meditation, not that long, like 10, 15 minutes. And I, we land in their land of big dreams, okay? And then I have them go to their intuition and just kind of, you know, without knowing how you're going to get there, without just for themselves without you know nobody's judging them i have them see everything that they want in their life or let's say in their sports career mm -hmm. right and then i have it have them write it down in present tense and that's like a first first draft and then you got to do it again and again because maybe the imagination it's you know dialed down a little bit since childhood because we haven't used it so much can you imagine and then you, you do it again. And all of a sudden, these details, they start to fill out, right? I give you an example. I was visualizing a house for my family and myself and like a housing complex. And in the beginning, it was just a freaking block with no details. And I, you know, I couldn't fill it out. Even if I try to make it up, I couldn't. And I just went there day in, day, every day, every day. And now I can, I can go upstairs to the right. You know, I know where the kitchen is. So it's, it's really cool. And it starts to fill out with details. So I would say you got to know what you want. It's, it's interesting. What, what I think about when you say this is the, the writing process that a lot of, you know, authors describe is you write a really bad first draft yeah. and then it's like, it's like 20% writing and 80% editing. And it's, it, it sounds very similar to what you're describing here, where first you just need to put something down on the paper and, and then, but then it doesn't, it doesn't, if you stop there, you, you cut yourself short. Uh, you, you have to keep, improving it and building upon it and tweaking it and and, and that's a, is, is it a, how much of it is a continuous process how much of it is a you do that a few times and then you set yourself and and just kind of execute um how do you how do you balance those two yeah i it depends a bit from person to person but I, what i you know you will i always say like you will feel when it's right I've also had um, goals or dreams of mine that I thought, okay, this is it. And I, after like a month, I realized, you know, between all these that I have, when I tune into that one, it doesn't, it doesn't feel that right. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it changes. It's never set in stone. It's, it's, but it gives you a direction where you're moving towards. And you know how it is. We have to adjust and, you know, things change and things happen. You, and, and also, you know, it, Sometimes you meet one person and that person changes your life because you go and then, so you got to be open to that. But I, I just think you have to have this 
you have to have a basis of if you know, you know, not a lot of people know when you ask on the street, Hey, you know, what do you want to do in life and all that? You know, people, are, right. But if you, if you're one of those people that can give a congruent answer and, you know, with, with confidence and you can say it, it's already rare, but that's what you see with, with everybody that's successful in life. They all say the same things. It's like, you look at all, all the different cultures, different, you know, continents, different upbringing, but they're saying the same things about when it, when it comes to success and they just, they can see where they want to go. Right. And some of them have a vision and it takes them 30, 40 years to do it. Others, maybe just a year, but the process is the same. And, and so I don't think there's like a, a one way thing. What's important is that, and that's what I do when I do the one-on-one -on -one coaching is I basically just check if what they're saying, what they're visualizing is really in like congruent with what their heart wants. And it's not just what they think, like, you know, or what their sister thinks they should do and all that. Right. Because yeah, that, that's really like, I, I see that as my job and that's really beautiful, like to test and to ask the questions and you find out right like, pretty fast, you know, how, how they talk, how they light up and yeah. Like you said, it has to come from within. And uh, so maybe can you talk a bit more about the, this idea of the outside influences that we all have on our own thinking on you know the pressures that we have around us loved ones society um how do we how can we maybe recognize those influences from the outside that might be maybe misguiding us or hampering our like you said our, our dreams and our our aspirations how can we recognize those and, and deal with them yeah very very cool question so what what i would say what most people who are not um who weren't introduced to how powerful they really are, right? So again, it doesn't make them any better or worse. It's just like, you're not a better person if you know how to cook. You're not a better person if you know how to drive a car, right? It doesn't change the value of you as a human being. But what most people do is they look at their present results and then those present results, they kind of dictate their thoughts, which dictate their feelings, which produces action, okay? And, but it's based, the starting point is the present results that they're getting. And what we're doing, and that's often like I set the stage and I say, we're going to break this cycle. And the new starting point is your thoughts because you have full control over what you want to think, right? Like maybe not, again, if you're bungee jumping, then, you know, things <laughs> just happen. But say you're in a quiet, you know, quiet time in a rocking chair, just chilling out. You can think what you want to think. So make that your starting point, your thoughts. Then these thoughts that are empowering that you chose, they cause feelings, which then, you know, produce action and those get you new results. So that's, that's where you want to start. You want to start from the inside. That's where they say the power, you know, the giant within Tony Robbins, the power, the personal power. It's, that's why we don't want to look at the outside. We want to just close our eyes and start from within and a good analogy and with social media and all that, and we talked about that before is like, again, a lot of people think, and that's what it looks like on TV and everywhere is that they got to have something first that they can go and do something and then become somebody. But it's the other way around. It's like, it's, you close your eyes, you decide who you want to be. Then you go out and you do, and as an end result, with a bit of time lag, you will have, right? That's how it really works. And so the cool thing about it is that it gives you all the power because it starts with you deciding who you want to be. And that, I think that concept is, and that's where when you, all that energy that goes on the outside, comparing with others, checking what they're doing. And when, the, when you take that back and focus on what you really want, you're breaking the cycle and, and it, it's a new world after that. But that also means, correct me if I'm wrong, but that also means taking responsibilities for all your own flaws and all your shortcomings as a person. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but also accepting them. Like, I mean, look, we, I mean, yeah, nobody's perfect and we don't need to be, right? I mean, we're doing our best. If you do your best every day, you're going to be a success. You're going to have a fulfilled life and, you know, everybody makes mistakes and just don't make them twice, I guess. How, how do you, how do you help people uh, get through that part of the taking responsibility for 
like you said, not only your life and what you want to become, but what you, what you are currently. And like you said, we, we all have flaws and, and that's, and we always will do no matter how much it, we have to strive towards an ideal. Um, and the ideal will always judge us because of our shortcomings. Uh, we will never be perfect, but we, we have to try. Uh, but it, there is a, there is a, there is a, a difficulty to accepting the fact that you, 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 you want all those things yet there's so little that you're actually doing, or there's so many things that you do that run counter to that. So how, how do you help people work through that? Yeah. And we all want it now, right? We want it right now. Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, the struggle is real, huh? It's, I mean, especially also the younger generation. And I would say I'll include myself in that is like, you know, you order a pizza and 10, 15 minutes later, it's here, right? It's everything is like now, 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 now. But what I, what I found really helpful for myself and is look, really study the people that we look up to listen to what they say don't just look at the social media because you know they're honest about it they're honest that it, it was hard work and that it took them years or, or 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 decades to get to where they are like tony robbins for example you know his he i think the story was that he wanted to do a, he did a seminar the first one that he did and he got a huge ballroom you know put all his savings into that right and then there's three people that showed up <laughs> you know, so when you hear when you hear these stories, those real stories from these people that you look up to, it's like, okay, well, this this okay, this happened to me, so I'm on track. I think that it's about it's about perspective. It's and that's why I'm a big fan of investigating and, and going deeper into you know learning from how other people did it, what mistakes they did, because they say um, you know a, a dumb person doesn't learn from mistakes. A somewhat smart person learns from his or her own mistakes, but a genius learns from other people's mistakes as well. And, you know, or, or just insights and transformations and everything. So I'm a big fan of studying and really going deep on what their journey was and not just, you know, the hype that's coming on, on Instagram, boom, you know, like, but what's behind the scenes. And thankfully, a lot of them share it uh, generously, you know, and that, that's pretty cool. You, you said studying, um, mm -hmm. because obviously just reading the book, <laughs> the one book or the, the other book doesn't get you to where you want to. So when you talk about studying, what's the process of trying to gar gain that, those insights? And then how do you translate those into, into action once you've uh, acquired the information? Because the information is one thing and the application is another. Yeah, that's right. So for example, I did this morning with uh, one of my 11 year old tennis players. Okay. Um, beautiful, beautiful kid, um, very talented. And his idol is Roger Federer. Okay, cool. He's Swiss also. So pretty good. We're good there. I love Roger. So we went on YouTube. And we put on an interview that Roger gave about mental strength, mental toughness, mental skills, the mental gain and all that. And in a five minute clip, like Roger must have said like 10 times that it is hard work and that it took him a long time to master this. Right. So, you know, even though it's on YouTube, but that's for me, that's research because I asked the kid, what did he say five times just in the last two minutes? And what did he say in the next two minutes? What did he say five times again? Oh, I didn't hear it. Oh, we'll go back and you listen. And then he hears it from his idol. That is hard work. And not just from me, because it's one thing hearing it from me. But when you hear it from Roger, you know, like the same concept. And, and so I think, you know, research can be done in articles. It can be on YouTube. You, you find the, the bits and pieces everywhere when you know what you're looking for. Right. And I wanted to convey the message that this mental mental skills is not it's literally like any muscle. If you start doing it very fast, it's mm. it's no difference than it's no different than training your physical body. And the cool thing is almost all athletes and coaches, they understand that because the, you know, if you go, I tell them what happens if you go to the gym once a month, not much, right? If you go once a week, you can have results. You, know, you tell me you can get results, right? Once a week, yeah. if you do it right. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then, but if you go every other day, you're going to get like absolutely super fit with the right guidance. And it's the same thing with the visualization. If you have a dream and you think about it once a month, you don't give it that much energy, you know? But if you start to think about it every week or every day, 
you give it a lot of energy and what you focus on. And Tony Robbins says where energy, no, where focus goes, energy flows. Mm -hmm. And you nurture that dream and you do it every day and it'll start to manifest. So yeah, and, and the analogy is really simple and every athlete's on every athlete understands it. And that that's a blessing for me, right? To because you don't have to convince them and oh, you know, they get it. Yeah, it's just transferring a skill that they've already or a a process that they've already uh, mastered if they are at a, at a high level already and just reapplying it to a different uh, realm, which is like you said, the, the mental side of things. Exactly. And they have the, the, you know, they have that, these uh, most athletes have, and that's why I love transitioning from executives to athletes. Mm. Is they have this, I describe it as a, a burning desire to be the, like to see how far they can go and be the best, best self mm -hmm. and that is really beautiful you know that when somebody has that you, you can see it feel it and and that's beautiful to work with somebody because the executives some of them not all of them but some you know they just got a new team for example and their boss said well you have to go and take a leadership class course or whatever and i kind of came was like so david i'm here you know now <laughs> make, make me a leader and you know <laughs> not not all of them but some and yeah, that doesn't, doesn't really work. So, and with the athletes, it's different game. You talked about that quote unquote muscle that we had to, you know, work on regularly. You, you also mentioned visualization. Is that uh, one of the, one of the elements that you try to, to put in place in order to uh, work on that, on that vision and, and, and like you said, focus on it regularly so that it can, it can grow, it can build and it can become that driving force that, kind of pulls you in the, in the right direction? Yeah, hundred percent. So that's, that's the bread and butter I would say is visualization and it's, you know, there's different types of visualization. Obviously, for example, if you're a, if you're an MMA fighter, right, you can go in and you can experience all kinds of situations in your head already. And then when they happen, you've kind of seen them before and maybe you're not panicking and so on. So that's like one type. Then there's, we had a billiards player and he couldn't train for three months during the lockdown in Germany. And he was visualizing for three hours a day and he was measuring, you know, on an app, how he was shooting before and after, and he shot better after. And there's a lot of plenty of research also with basketball players where they did controlled um, experiments with piano players, with all kinds of things that visualization can be can be even more powerful than being on the court and, and shooting or like the same. So it's very, very powerful. So that's one part. But then I also think there's the visualization about where you want your career or your life to go or your relationships, right? So for example, with my girlfriend, I, every day I tune in for 30 seconds or a minute on how I want the relationship to be. And it's absolutely phenomenal how, how this works because then again, when I, when I see her, well, we live together now, but it's just been taken off and it's, I'm so in love and I've never had that. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with, you know, me like thinking about it, giving that energy, knowing what I want. And then it's really easy for me to be that way because I'm totally myself. And, and so, yeah, I, I think there's different types of visualizations, but they're very powerful. And when you think about it, imagination, you know, like, a dog or a cow they don't have imagination this is one of those gifts that god has given us and what is imagination if you think about it i mean have you had this moment when you're relaxed and you're thinking wow this is pretty cool 10 years ago i thought about this and now it's a reality yeah yeah it's it's happened so it's like if you know how to use it or even if you don't know how to use it sometimes right it's like the ability to look into the future if you want mm -hmm. And, and so I, I would just make the case that this is a pretty cool skill to have and, and we should learn, learn a bit more about it. And, um, and, you know, a lot of people are very good at imagining bad stuff. Like worry and doubt is like, it's a possibility it can happen. And we're really good at painting the picture of what could go wrong and all that. But if you can do that, you can also do the other. It's just like, you have a shitty habit. I'm not judging. Hi, hey, I have, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's a shitty habit to imagine all the bad. My mom. Oh God. I'll tell, I'll tell you a story. Like when I travel, I'm 33 years old, right? When I travel, she is so worried and I always have to text her when I land, right? If I don't do that, she will have a bad sleep. She'll be like, you know, up all night. It's, it's, it's terrible. And the same with my brother and my sister. 
Does that make any sense? It does not, right? It is, she could ask me, what am I doing? Who am I meeting? What am I doing for fun? And so on. But she's not asking those empowering questions. She's worried. Why? Because probably at some point in her life, because we were little rascals, it made sense to check in. But it's just a shitty habit. She, she's not aware of it. And it just happens. Um, and it's not very empowering for her. It doesn't make her feel that good. She can worry maybe a little bit and then, you know, but it's just a habit. And I think that's with a lot of people, it's just, it's, it's a habit that we were conditioned to imagine like the bad stuff. But if you can do that, you know, you have the skill, you can also turn it into, you know, imagining where you want to go. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. I feel 100% guilty of it. I was actually having that conversation with my wife yesterday. And she was saying, you know, every time things are good, you have to, and that's to me, you have to, um, and rightly so, and rightly so, you, you, you have to always find something that's bad and, or, or just find some hardship in what's going on instead of just appreciating the, the good moment that we're having or the good situation that we're in. Um, and, and, and it's, so it, it, it sounds very true that so much energy is spent on that, on that negative stuff, my, myself first. Um, but if you can reallocate that uh, and, and move it to, to a more positive outlook, uh, that, that becomes very powerful. You talked about the different kinds of visualizations. So can you talk a little bit about the technique specifically? It, let's, let's stay on the, on the topic of you know, the life you want to build, the person you want to be. Uh, are there certain, certain ways to talk to yourself uh, inside your head? Are there, are there certain things to, to visualize in a certain way? What's, what's the process of this? Yeah. So the way we do it is that we have, we call them choices. Okay. We call them choices because that is also one of the beautiful thing is you can, you can choose as a human being with your conscious, you know, you can choose what, what you want basically. And so we call them choices. Um, and I have 10, 10 sentences and it's always, I choose the end result of, Right. And then they, so for one of them, for example, is I choose the end result of spreading magic to the sports world. For me, magic is, you know, for me, that comes up is all what I've learned about us being creators and us creating what we love. Okay. And being ourselves. That's for me. It's like magic. Cause when I first learned about it, it's like, how, how does that work? Right. And when you start to understand it, it's, it's not magic. It, it works according to laws, basically, uh, not basically it works according to laws. Um, but so then I, I close my eyes and for 30 seconds, I tune into whatever comes. Usually it's like very, very similar. I, I personally see myself, for example, in a big tennis stadium, uh, you know, on the, on the sidelines up there as a coach, as a friend, as a fan of one of my players, I see Wimbledon all the time. Okay. And I'm like there. Yeah. And I, I see that very vividly and I can feel the emotion. So that's the other thing you, you don't only want to have the movie in your head. You also want to feel the emotions because in the end of the day, it's the emotions that move us into action, right? And, that, and, and so you want to have it, you want to start out in your head, visualize. And again, if it's not very clear in the beginning, don't worry. It, it wasn't clear for me. It wasn't clear for everybody else. It will become clear if you do it. Right. And then, and then you want to get like emotionally involved. As I said, with the bungee jump, it was really easy to get emotionally involved in it and <laughs> relive it. And with other things, it might be a bit more difficult, but uh, yeah, so that's the process. And it's, you know, it doesn't need to, to be very long because it's more about consistency than, you know, visualizing for like two hours once and then letting it go. It's about doing it every day because didn't, what, what did um, Aristotle say? Um, excellence is no he said we become or we are what we do every day mm. excellence then is not an act but a habit right you want to you just want to like take 15 minutes of your day at least that's what i do 15 minutes and and just visualize my future basically and get emotionally involved and it's not it's not rocket science i teach it to 11 year old kids you know and the stuff is not hard you, you talked about the um evolving nature of the of the thoughts and of the vision uh it, it, do you do you like you said you have those 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 phrases so do you go through each one every every day or do, is it is it kind of more of a free-flowing um process I, I guess 
if you do it every day, now you, you know them and you can go through them without looking at them. But at the start, can it be helpful to, to have a little list of, okay, I'm, I'm going to visualize this and then that, and then that, and, and, and kind of build off of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you write it down because you go to your land of big dreams. So if you really do the whole goal setting thing for the, like all 10 choices, let's say, then you got to spend more time in your land of big dreams because you got to extract everything that you see. Right. And so you write everything down that you see and now you kind of extract the themes, you know, some will be around family, some will be around the sport, some will be about maybe money and things. And, you know, you just kind of like order them into themes. Then you word it in a way that get your, get, gets your creative juices going that excite you. Like for me, spreading magic to the sports world. It's like, poof, I know what I'm, you know, I know what I mean. And it's for me. Right. So, um, or the same with the relationship with my, my girlfriend, I have the end result of a sexual adventurous and passionate relationship with my girlfriend. And for me, all these three adjectives, they add a lot of like cool things to it. Right. So, um, so yeah, you, you, you go through them in order. And then what, what we also do is every day we take one or two choices and we add the current reality to it. What that means is you go into the vision, what it is, and then you say, okay, now I go into the current reality of where I am today in relation to where I want to go. Mm. And everything, you just like put it in there. You know, it, it could also be psychological tension in a sense when you, when you want to be a public speaker and you're realizing you're still scared. You know, it's not good or bad, but it's something that has to be addressed. And the way you address it is like you kind of dump it. You just say, you acknowledge it. You say, oh, but I'm still scared. There's still work to do. And you just say, okay, this is my current reality. And with that, you're creating what we call structural tension. It's like, it's literally like, like a rubber band. It's the, the structural tension. It will resolve in favor of the vision. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the vision here, you know, this is hanging like that. If you don't have the current reality, there's also no tension. So you want to like have the tension and then that will resolve itself into, into the vision. And if you have a fuck up, which can happen, right? It's just like more tension, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's like the idea behind it that you always incorporate the current reality. You don't have to do it every day, but you kind of through the week, you do all the choices. Also, you say, okay, this is where I am. And uh, yeah. That's the process. It, it's, it's, it, it, it comes back to it being the relationship between the two, it, between the two states, the end state and the current state. Uh, but again, like you said, in isolation, each one of those doesn't mean much. You have to tie them together. That's, that's a really powerful thing for me. I, I think of, you probably know or know of Gary Vaynerchuk, mm -hmm. and he talks about clouds and dirt. You have the clouds, which is the dream, and you have the dirt, which is the work that you put in every day to achieve that. But you, the, you always have to be in the middle of those two, or at least going back and forth between the two. Uh, because like you said, it's, the, 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 that relationship keeps you moving in the right direction. Because if you're just always in the cloud, or if you're always in the dirt, then you, you lose that middle bit. And you, you're actually, well, you're, you're not, I don't know, complete comes to mind. It's maybe not the best word, but... It, it, they have to work together in order for you to, to, to get there. Yeah, beautiful. See, all these smart people, they're saying, it's, they're saying like the same things. They're just using different words and different. <laughs> but yeah, the, these principles, I'm, I mean, yeah, that's, that's you know, even, even already in the Bible, they were saying, know thyself. You know that there's so many, that wisdom has been around for a long time, um, I'm finding out. <laughs> but um, yeah, they're saying the same thing. Right. So it's beautiful. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about changing habits because we all, we all have them and we, we are, how to say that we're, we're not ruled by our habits, but I mean, oftentimes we are. Um, and we, like you said, we are our habits. How do you impart change on things that you do every day and you want to stop or on things that you don't do and you want to start doing? Yeah. So to maybe, explain like one of the, the simplest concept, but the most powerful concept that I have come across is what we call the stick person. And the stick person is basically is a big circle, which is your mind. And then you have a little circle at the bottom, which is your body. 
and the mind, and by the way, the brain is part of the body, okay? No, the mind, we have a picture because nobody's ever seen the mind. And then you have the top half of the mind and the bottom half of the mind. The top half is your conscious mind. This is what we use to pay attention to each other right now, right? This is where the imagination is, where you choose your thoughts, is like the thinking mind, the educated mind. And then you have the subconscious mind below that, which is the emotional mind. And it's the subconscious mind that is running your body. There's all the programming, all the habits, they all sit in there. And the subconscious mind is running your body, like it's running every cell of your body because you can't consciously think about everything, right? So it's your subconscious that's running your body. Then it's your body that moves into action. And it's the actions that you take that will give you the results. So when you change a habit, what you have to understand is that just knowing something in your conscious mind in the top half of that circle doesn't translate into new results because you haven't internalized that knowledge yet. Right. So I, an example before, like a habit, you know, for when I was swimming and that was a bad habit, I was, when I was swimming freestyle for a while, I was crossing my arms over like that, mm -hmm. which is no bueno because your, your legs start to like go like this and you have more drag. Right. So that's, let's say that's a shitty habit. So then I consciously, I knew, I understood, I have to swim shoulder wide, right. To be faster. I, mm -hmm. I got that, but I still like, I couldn't do it when I was tired and all that. So what I had to do is I had to constantly for thousands, probably 10,000s of strokes, think about swimming like this, maybe even exaggerate a little bit. And I did it again and again, but I was thinking, 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 and it was hard. It was hard work. But after a while, I'll in, I internalized it. It went into my subconscious mind. I mastered the move and then my body took different action and I got different results. All right. So for changing a habit, I actually, I, almost want to call it a formula because it's working so well for me and the people I work with is that I, what I do is like, I imagine what I want. Okay. Because it's got to come from the heart. If you want to really want to change it, you got to really want it. And then I add a little spice to that, that I talk to myself in the mirror and tell myself what all the negative stuff is. But if I continue with that habit, you know, what, what's all the, the bad stuff coming from that? And then I make a promise to somebody like my mother or my girlfriend that I'm going to, you know, stop doing that or I'm going to start doing this. And I found that to be super, super powerful because in the beginning it can happen that you slip like biting, uh, biting my fingernails is a good example right now. I promised my girlfriend last week I'll stop. I don't think I've cut my fingernails in like 25 years or something. Yeah, well, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah yeah so so try this so do you want to change it i would love to change that okay good so now what you can do is like every morning you talk to you i know it takes a bit of courage and i had to close the bathroom door in the beginning because i felt weird and all that you know it's all normal but you don't start to feel comfortable you talk to yourself and you you know you just whatever comes to your mind what's shitty about it you tell yourself look yourself in the eye tell yourself and then make a promise to your wife or to your kids and say, I'm going to change it. And then, you know, I find myself, I'm sitting here starting, and I was like, oh, I made a promise. You know, I want to change this. And then in the beginning, it's, yeah, it's, it's not easy. And it's like Lord of the Rings, the, uh, <laughs> you know, but then you still do it. And that message, when you can do that, that, that means your subconscious, what it's picking up is you set out to change something. You follow through with it. That means I'm powerful. Mm -hmm. And when you say, I'm going to change something, and then you don't do it, your subconscious picking up, he's not powerful. He doesn't, you know, I'm running this. It's not. And so it becomes easier, right? Every, every habit that you change is like, well, I did it with that. And I think the promise, the, the promise to somebody that you really love and appreciate, and that's really cool. I, that adds a lot of, it makes it easy, I think, almost easy. I also like, I want to come back on the one point that you mentioned that uh, at least hit me pretty hard a while back. And I, th I think it was Jordan Peterson again, that the idea of writing out or imagining the, the po potential negative consequences of not changing something. Um, it was, uh, for me, that was a very, very powerful thought when I first came upon it. It was like, you want to imagine the life that you want to have and the person you can be but you also want to imagine the person you might become if all things go the wrong way and you do, you make all the wrong decisions at the, at, at, at the, at a given time. And that thought 
you know, for me, it was, I'm homeless. I'm an alcoholic. I like to drink. I'm an alcoholic. I'm living under a bridge. I don't have a wife anymore. I don't have my kids. And, and that's, and that's a scary thought when you start to picture it. And I don't know if it, if this in, in and of itself changed a whole bunch of things, but even just having that thought and, and, and sitting with it for a minute, it, it does something to you, right? It, oh, it, yeah. it forces you it, it, because now you have the pull in the right direction and you have the push from the opposite direction. So it's, yeah. it's like you said, you have the rubber band pulling you up towards your, 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 your big dreams, but you also have the, I don't know, what comes to mind is like the fire from below keeping you, keeping you away from, from the, all that, you know, really, because we all have that inside of us. We all have the, the good and the bad and, and what we manifest in the world is, is going to depend on, on our choices and our actions. So mm. having that, those flames underneath your ass to, to speak crudely helps you go in the right direction. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. That's why, you know, yeah. Uh, for me, it was, I mean, yeah, I can say it for me it was stop smoking weed. <sighs> Difficult at first, you know, I tried everything and nothing worked. And then with this, Technique, I, you know, I just told myself, your, your lungs are going dark. You're not performing in, in, in an MMA. You're going to get tired. You smell bad. You're not the best version of yourself. You're not really paying attention. Like you, you, you forget things and you're tired more often. And, you know, all these things. And I just, I look myself in the eye and I was like, you, you like really look, look deep. Take a, it's maybe uncomfortable, but, you know, take a moment and, and just like, well, is that really me? Is that really, you know, where... I want to go where I want to stay. And I was like, fuck no. And then that, the fire, the, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, everybody's different, but I think the a little bit of fire, yeah. Or like the shark or the crocodile that's coming up, you know, can't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, for me, for the, the weed is still something I, I smoke once in a while. And for a while I smoked quite a bit. And at the beginning for me, it was almost like a, you know, oh, I can I can do this thing in the evening and not get a hangover in the morning. But I realized down the road that the road that I'm not the same in the morning if I if I spend an evening smoking, even if I smoke a little bit, I, I feel it the next day. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my body. And that's definitely something I didn't acknowledge at first. It was I was it was I guess it was still the honeymoon period. It was like, oh, because I, 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 I started smoking quite late and I started drinking when I was a teenager, like probably every teenager out there. Um, and just switching was like, oh, that's cool. You know, that's different. It feels different. And I, def I would definitely say it doesn't feel as bad as, a, <laughs> as an alcohol hangover. Mm -hmm. But at least personally, I would say I still, I still get a, a weed hangover, if that's even a thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it is, it is a thing for me too. But, you know, what is also interesting is that we probably, when we're into smoking it, we kind of downplay it, right? We're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it's not, nothing compared to that. And then when we want to change it, all of a sudden we change perspective and we can be more honest about it and be like, well, it, it was, or maybe when we stop, we're like, oh my God, I'm fit now. You know, in the morning I get up without an alarm. It's like mm -hmm. what it does. I'm an early riser now. I wasn't for a long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these things change. It's about changing perspectives and yeah. Yeah. Uh, David, what are some of the things you are setting yourself uh, out to achieve things that obviously you could maybe share publicly on this podcast. What are the, some of the things you'd like to achieve for yourself in the next couple of years? Yeah. So with the tribe of athletes, which is my, my, my business, right? Where we coach athletes. I would, what I see the vision for me, what I see is that we, we coach athletes now that are still active in their career and that they are so like blown away by how cool this whole mental thing is and how much you know how much fulfillment they're getting from it and how they can apply these things in all areas of life because that's one one of the things that i'm saying is that when you because there's a lot of athletes that are really good at what they do but it's not necessarily because they are i mean some of them are aware of how they do it but others they just get good programming from the good environment and then for example they're a good athlete but then they're a shitty husband or a shitty father or something right and the beautiful thing about this is when you know how the mind works and how you're creating, it's you can transfer that to other areas of your life because you know how you do it. And also, you can then 
pass it on to others because you know what the, the, the process is behind it. So what my vision is with the tribe of athletes is that we're coaching athletes now because the business is still young. But when these athletes are done with their active career and they want to stay involved in the sports industry, they w- and, and just imagine how cool it would be to have you know, somebody who's an MMA fighter, for example, he has all, all the knowledge now, has had his career, has all the contacts in MMA, you know, knows the game better than anybody else or better than me, let's say. And then you have these people who want to work in the sports industry and pass on their knowledge and their experience and then just kind of come work with us. And so that we can have, you know, the MMA, the tennis, the football, the rugby, like all these specialists mm-hmm. who are helping with the athletes. So that's, that's what I, w- I would love to create because I see, yeah, I just see, I see sports. It's such a beautiful platform to learn these things because we're playing a game. In MMA, okay, they're trying to kind of kill themselves, but <laughs> other than that, you know, there's some extreme sports that are, are about life and death. Mm. But if we're talking about regular sports, it's, it's a game. And we can try and experiment and grow and learn while we're playing a game. And that is a privilege, I think. And, and so, uh, yeah, I just want to, and, you know, it sets you up for life if you know these things. And um, that's the vision that I see with the Tribe of Athletes. And that's like my baby right now. That's what I'm working hard at. I, I really like it, David. And, and I really appreciate you coming on the podcast to talk about all of this year. All, everything we've talked about has got me pretty uh, fired up. Where can people find out more about you and about Tribe of Athletes and what you're doing there? Yeah. So th- thanks for having me on, Sean. You're a wonderful very skilled podcast host, I have to say, is beautiful. And I appreciate um, the compliment. Thank you. Yeah, big time. And also, I mean, to, to find me, it's very simple. I would just say the homepage, which is the tribe of athletes.com. And um, yeah, everything is there, all the like the programs that we have, and we'll update it. So that, that's a good place to. I'm on Instagram and all tribe of athletes, you'll, you'll find me. Awesome. Well, the link is in the podcast description. David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, brother.